I'm Mark Van Gessel, Extension Wheat Specialist with the University of Delaware. I was asked to talk about atrazine, uh, particularly what's going on in the registration world with, with atrazine. Uh, atrazine has been, you know, a staple herbicide for a long time, but just in the last six months, there's been a lot of information um, in popular press about atrazine. And uh, so I'd like to just provide a little bit more background on why that is, what's coming up with some of the issues with atrazine, and just to help stay a little bit more informed on this topic. So, you know, we know atrazine has been a um, product herbicide that's been used on a lot of the major crops in the U.S., particularly the, the corn, whether it's field corn or sweet corn. It's used a lot on sorghum and sugarcane, and those are probably the four largest acreage crops where atrazine is currently used. Atrazine has been around for a long time. It was first registered in the U.S. in the late 1950s. I think 1959 was the first year. Um, it's a very flexible herbicide in that we can use it for pre-emergence or residual control, or we can also use it for post-emergence control. So it's something in particularly in corn and sorghum we're using at planting. Uh, for residual control, and then post-emergence, a little bit later after the crop is up to control weeds that, that might uh, come up, provide some, some post-emergence, act selective post-emergence activity in these crops. When it was first registered, it was um, registered for a number of, of commodities, not only corn and sorghum, but pineapples and warm season turf, rangeland, forestry. Um, it had a lot of uses. When it was first registered, the use rates were much higher than what they are now. In fact, uh, prior to 1990 in field corn, we were able to use up to four pounds of atrazine per year. Currently, the label restricts it to two and a half pounds per year. So you know, as, as time went on, our use rates have reduced. It's because of its widespread use and oftentimes it's been the, the predominant, if not only herbicide used in some of these fields, particularly back in the 60s and 70s, uh, resistance developed very soon. We've been dealing with resistance to atrazine since the 1970s. In fact, one of the first sites was here in the east um, in Maryland with uh, atrazine resistance. But the fact that atrazine resistance has been so widespread, it's still being used today. Uh, Atrazine is still very effective on a number of species that uh, uh, other herbicides are just not very effective on. I know in our area, we have a lot of uh, glyphosate and ALS-resistant common ragweed. Um, so it's a challenge for us to control. Yet atrazine is a very effective tool for us to use to control it in rotational crops. We have a lot of morning glory, annual morning glory pressure in some of our fields. Atrazine's the best herbicide that we have found for use in field corn um, for morning glory. So while there's been a lot of resistance and very widespread resistance, it's still a very useful tool for um, a lot of producers. So currently atrazine is used primarily in four crops, field corn, sweet corn, sorghum, and sugar cane. Uh, the use rates differ by crop. Um, uh, use rates also differ by application timing or soil type. Um, there's differences in weed spectrum, and particularly in our area, where we're growing a lot of vegetables. Uh, the use rates and use patterns differ by our crop rotations. Today, atrazine is typically used in combination with other herbicides. It's not used just alone. Um, it's in the corn sorghum uh, market. It's usually used with a chloroacetamide herbicide, such as Asmatolachlor or pyroxulfone, product like that. Um, so it's not used alone very often. It's often used in combination with other herbicides to help enhance their performance. Um, in our area, it's, we're often using it in combination with Paraquat to improve its performance for burn down in early spring. Um, we're using it with our HPPD inhibiting herbicides or the group 27s to enhance performance. So it, it really is a useful tool um, in m many ways. Um, it's currently registered, we currently have over 110 registered products that um, with, with atrazine in them. And this includes a lot of our premixes. So it's, there's, there's a lot of uh, 
uh, usage out there and a lot of popularity with, with atrazine. Um, and there's over 20 registrants that have at least a product of glyphosate registered and sold under their um, label. So let me back up a little bit and uh, talk about where we're at and how we got where we're at with atrazine right now. Um, as way of introduction, the um, all of our pesticides are regulated under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or often referred to as FIFRA. Um, FIFRA is the federal label or the federal law that governs the registration process, the distribution and sale of pesticides in the U.S. So when a registrant, when a company develops a new pesticide, they have to go through the FIFRA process to get it registered. FIFRA requires EPA to reevaluate pesticides every 15 years. So even though the product has been in the marketplace for a number of years, this re-evaluation or re-registration process allows uh, EPA and registrants to reevaluate the, 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 the pesticides, make sure that there's still no unreasonable adverse effects as our science evolves, um, as our understanding of pesticides in the environment um, evolves. We want to make sure that still no unreasonable adverse effects um, is observed both for human health as well as in the environment. So this is an ongoing process for all pesticides, this re-registration process. In the re-registration process, if there are concerns that develop for either human health um, or uh, environmental exposure, they need to be addressed. And they can have additional uh, changes to the label or restrictions or mitigations, whichever term you want to use, you know, to make sure that they have no undue effect um, either on the users or on the environment. And this is based on both the risk to cause undue effect as well as the benefits of that herbicide. So there's, there's a trade-off, if you will, between risks and benefits under the FIFRA and the re-registration. To go along with that, EPA also has the obligation under the Endangered Species Act that when products, pesticides are evaluated and registered, that they make sure that they have no undue effect on endangered species. Under the Endangered Species Act, it considers only risks. Unlike FIFRA, which considers both risks and benefits under the Endangered Species Act, when a pesticide is being evaluated, it's being evaluated strictly based on its risk. So atrazine is undergoing this periodic 15 year review. Um, as I said, all pesticides are required to undergo this, this review. Um, it's been established under FIFRA and it was just atrazine's turn to um, go through the process. So, you know, like all pesticides, um, through this re-registration process, um, they're looking back at any new findings uh, since the last registration, you know, has the use pattern of atrazine changed, use pattern in terms of timing that's used, crops that it's used on, rates that it's being used at. Um, during the process, again, because it's a re-registration process under FIFRA. They're considering risks as well as the benefits of that product. And when the risk is not only the risk that's occurring in the field, either to humans or the environment, but it's also looking at the potential of off-target movement of that herbicide or that pesticide. Is it moving off the field and posing a risk to, to the environment? When they're looking at the effect, um, non-target effects of, of uh, pesticides, they often are looking at something called the concentration equivalent level of concern. So it's, it's that level that um, you start to see detrimental effects, that concentration of that pesticide that, that we start to see these detrimental effects on. And they're looking at it both in, in terrestrial as well as aquatic environments. And again, because um, a new emphasis by the EPA is also looking um, at the impact of pesticides on the endangered species during the re-registration process. The process for re-registration 
as well as registration is laid out here. It's a primarily a six step process. We first do the preliminary um, plan of work, final plan of work, ask for more data if it's necessary, and then render final decisions. Throughout the process, there are opportunities for public comments um, along those ways. So in a little bit more detail on this registration or uh, registration review process, again, requires, it occurs 15 years, ensures that the pesticides continue to meet regulatory standards, and there's opportunity for input. But really what they're looking at is what has changed since the last assessment, the last evaluation. Um, what are the magnitudes of these changes? Um, are these, uh, have there been changes to the use and are there alternatives available? Need to decide whether new information or new studies are needed and is the process likely to change with new information? It's as the re-registration process is a multi-year process. It doesn't happen quickly. It's usually about a four to six um, year process. So the first step is the, pl uh, the work plans. Um, evaluate each individual products, identify if new studies and assessments are needed. If they are, to explain why those are needed. Um, set up timelines, identify where there may be some data gaps or uncertainties, and then ask for data from the registrants um, if necessary. During the preliminary process, public has the opportunity to make comments identify where there might be more data needed or maybe where some of the call for data is unnecessary. The next step is to develop a human health and ecological risk assessment um, based on how the herbicide is currently used, based on the, the herbicide registration. Um, are there any risks? And then in, and consider all available data. After the risk assessments, um, call in for data, um, public comments, um, they write a proposed interim decision. Um, this is an opportunity for the public again to comment on the risk assessments, evaluate the, the risk of the results of the risk assessments, and talk about the benefits of the pesticides. Discuss uh, potential mitigations that may be needed and propose mitigation measures are posted for public comment. Again, another opportunity for the public to, to comment on there. After the public comment period is, is closed, EPA re uh, evaluates them or, or reads them and summarizes them, um, comments on the public comments, and then releases their final registration decision. This process is not unique to atrazine. It's the steps that all pesticides go through during their re-registration process. So here's the timeline for atrazine re-registration. Uh, the preliminary work plan was released in June of 2013. So almost 10 years ago, um, this process was started. The ecological risk assessment was completed in June of 2016. And about two years later, the human risk assessment was completed. The interim decision was released in January of 2020. And then the interim decision, essentially the final decision, uh, was September 2020. Um, in that final decision, there were some changes to the label, particularly removing a number of uses uh, that were previously labeled. Um, things like uh, roadside, CRP ground, uh, conifer trees, uh, uh, perennial bioenergies, all those crops were removed from the label. But then very shortly after that, um, and, uh, a month later in October, the EPA received a petition that uh, alleging that the agency violated its duties under FIFRA by issuing atrazine without substantial evidence supporting their decision. So the courts required that they go back and reevaluate it um, and revisit their decision. Um, and it was in this process then that uh, of back of revisiting it that uh, decided that the level should move from 15 parts per billion 
to 3.4 parts per billion. They released then that interim registration review in June of 2022. Uh, there was an open comment period. That was the one where thousands of people responded to it. Um, and that comment period closed then in October of 2022. So where are we right now with the atrazine? Um, the proposed interim decision uh, was uh, open for public comments until October 7th of this year, uh, or of 2022. So it was just released. They had tens of thousands of comments, um, and EPA is currently reading through those comments um, and addressing them. Um, after that's done, after that uh, process of, of addressing the, the public comments, uh, there will be a interim decision or final decision made. However, that's not going to occur prior to the 2023 use season. What are the major issues with the atrazine re-registration process is concerned about the concentration levels of concern. Um, it has, over the years, the, the, the concentration level of concern has fluctuated, um, but currently, as it's being interpreted and used at the EPA, it's at 15 parts per billion. However, in their interim decision, they are going to base their level of concern at 3.4 parts per billion. And that's the, the big kind of crux of the discussions between EPA and registrants is, is that drop in level of concern from 15 to 3.5, 3.4 parts per billion. And that 3.4 parts per billion, if you look at surface waters, um, throughout the U.S., particularly in the grain, uh, the corn growing areas, most of our major watersheds are impacted by that. The EPA is basing their level of concern on water samples and modeling that they're finding in these watersheds. So as it relates to atrazine and the, the water samples, they're looking for a 60-day average concentration of atrazine that, when it's exceeded, presents a greater than 50% chance of negative negatively affecting the community structure that's been, as I mentioned, reduced from 15 parts per billion to 3.4 parts per billion. As I mentioned also, this parts per billion, the, this uh, level of concern has been a topic of, of discussion uh, with the EPA and with registrants. There's been three scientific advisory panels set to establish the level of concern since 2007. At the latest scientific advisory panel, there was a disagreement over 11 studies, um, particularly microcosm studies or, or small laboratory studies out of 50. So which of the studies to be included and which ones should be omitted in the analysis? The EPA Office of Pesticide Program intends to hold another FIFRA uh, scientific advisory panel sometime in 2023 to help sort out this issue of which of the studies should be included in the analysis and for the considerations of the LLCs. As I mentioned, the LLC is based on, um, for atrazine is based on protecting the aquatic environment, and making sure that it has no undue effect on the environment, but it was based on the FIFRA labeling. Um, it was not necessarily uh, established for the endangered species considerations. As I mentioned, uh, endangered species are now a factor that registration and re-registration needs to consider. However, EPA has started discussions with Fish and Wildlife Services and the National Marine Fisheries Services on atrazine and its potential impact on endangered species. With the assumption or uh, consideration that the mitigations and how they're addressing the LOC for aquatic environments will also be adequate to make sure it protects uh, for endangered species. However, if that the uh, services, if the Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Services find that those levels are not adequate to protect um, endangered species, further mitigations may be necessary. As I mentioned, 
they're monitoring atrazine um, in waterways and using models to predict uh, what the concentrations are. Um, the EPA is using a specific model called the WARP, Watershed Regression for Pesticides for Multiple um, for multiple pesticides. Um, it considers the atrazine use as well as the environmental factors at time of application. So what percentage of the watershed that this atrazine is being applied to as say a restrictive soil layer? Um, or what's the spring precip precipitation um, during time of application uh, that may cause off-target movement or leaching uh, um, lateral movement of atrazine off the field. They're pairing the, the modeling with some long-term water sampling studies, um, three in particular that they, they rely on. Um, they're listed here. Um, but one of the things that they're finding and needing is that sampling for atrazine levels in water needs to be done on a very frequent basis, more frequently than most studies uh, are sampling. And this is a graph that was presented by the EPA at a, a, at a webinar back in September, just illustrating this point. So you're looking at the, on the um, x-axis, uh, you're looking at uh, a, a year calendar, the Dots, the orange dots are what was the concentration on a 14 day sampling period um, with the dashed lines looking at what is the daily sampling um, in the same uh, uh, stream. I believe this was a stream. And you can see that if it's done on a 14 day basis, they may be missing some very high peaks that occur, you know, uh, presumably after a significant rainfall. So a 14 day sampling period is gonna give a much different picture than what a more frequent or daily sampling will be. Thus, that's why a lot of this is, is relying on, on modeling. They're also finding that the WARP model consistently underestimates what the atrazine levels were in the collected water samples. And so as a result, they're using a, um, extremely conservative approach of using a 50, a 95% confidence to account for this underestimating that goes, that goes along with this model. So looking at where these areas are that are being impacted, um, shown here, the um, blue are the areas where the level of atrazine are above the 3.4, they're between the 3.4 and a 9.8 parts per billion. The green or the teal color is even a higher level where the atrazine concentrations are above the 9.8. If you look and, and overlay corn production in the United States and sorghum production in the United States, it matches up with these areas um, quite well. So where we're using, where atrazine is an important product for weed control um, is where we're finding atrazine in these waterways. So what is the EPA proposing um, with uh, atrazine restrictions? Um, in their interim decision, they listed uh, lowering the maximum use rates for corn, sweet corn and sorghum to two pounds active ingredient per acre per year. Um, it would be limited um, the application based on timing of rainfall. So when a significant rainfall is predicted that no atrazine being applied for a period of time prior to that rainfall, no application to saturated soils, and their proposal was to use no aerial, to not allow aerial applications. In addition, if atrazine is gonna be applied in one of those affected watersheds, um, there will be additional mitigations required. Farmers could select these mitigation practices that prevent off-target movement of atrazine. The pick list, as they're referring to it, are based on the region, the soil erodibility, um, application rate to provide flexibility to the farmers so that they can still use atrazine while limiting its off-target and runoff potential. The mitigation, as I mentioned, limit off-target movement 
because of the characteristics of atrazine, most of its off-target movement, off-field movement is going to be associated with water runoff. So um, limiting the movement of water off the field and consequently atrazine movement. It allows atrazine to be used in all these affected areas. So none of the proposed mitigations are uh, eliminating the use of atrazine, it allows atrazine to be used, but albeit at much lower rates than what growers are currently using. But by using lower rates, uh, reducing the environmental risks. The number of mitigations that someone may need to use depends on your watershed, and by watershed, your levels of 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 uh, atrazine currently being uh, detected whether you're in the 3.4 to 9.6 parts per billion or in that region above 9.6 it also includes your soil erosion potential as well as um, what is the atrazine rate that you might be able to use i'm not going to go into a whole lot on the pick list because as i said this is a, a preliminary um decision right now and so and and it's being epa is considering the comments that they've received so these pick lists are likely to to change um but this is just to give you an idea of what does some of the uh, options mitigations were that were listed in the preliminary decision by the epa on atrazine so again the choice of using pick lists or these mitigations is to allow farmers in effective areas to continue to use atrazine, um, but using tactics to ensure that off-field movement does not become an issue. The alternative to these pick lists or uh, uh, mitigation tactics is to lose atrazine altogether. So it was an, the, the idea is using the pick list, these mitigations to ensure that farmers still have access to it. Um, and in order to do so, they may have to use reduced rates or implement mitigation. It's intended to give flexibility to growers um, so that they can select what works best for their fields and their situations. The use of pick lists under FIFRA uh, allows EPA to consider both the benefits and the risk of a pesticide. This concept of a pick list is not the first time with atrazine. It was used with the enlist label um, to help protect endangered species and off target movement. Um, so this idea of pick list is gonna be around for a while. It's uh, going forward. It's the, the way that the EPA is going to address mitigations. The goal of the pick list is to re reduce the environmental risk of atrazine or said herbicide um, while maintaining its use um, for growers. Changes to the atrazine label are not going to occur in 2023. So it still will be as your current labels are, are, are written is the use pattern for this coming season. Um, however, future changes to atrazine labels are very likely. And this is not just the straight atrazine, but all products containing atrazine. This use of and the endangered species uh, consideration for registration and re-registration is going to be for all pesticides moving forward. So again, we're going to see more of this use of pick lists uh, on pesticide labels in the future. As I mentioned in this process, public has an opportunity to comment and I guess I would say with my interactions with the EPA, they certainly are, are looking for comments. They encourage people to, to provide their comments. They review all comments that come in. But I should say that a lot of times the comments that come in as form letters are not necessarily what they're looking for. You know, the, the sheer number of form letters certainly gives them an indication of the concern or the impact of their decisions. However, they aren't always very helpful in terms of finding solutions to some of the thorny issues that they're trying to deal with. So individual letters tend to be more impactful. Share in your letters, share how that product is being used in your area in terms of the timing, the application numbers, the rates, but also be sure to address the issue that the EPA is looking for. You know, a lot of times letters come in that discuss the benefits of a product. 
um, not necessarily helpful in terms of making decisions going forward. They're looking for ideas and comments. They're looking for uh, better ways of doing what they're, they need to mitigate. They're looking be for better ways to mitigate. So anything that can be provided along those lines are going to be helpful. If you're looking to get into this topic a little bit more, looking for some more information on it, here's a few websites. Uh, the EPA website on atrazine um, is listed here. Um, the industry site, primarily uh, sponsored by Syngenta at atrazine.com. And the croplife.com also has a lot of good information, uh, uh, public um, popular press articles about this topic. So three choices uh, for information that'd be helpful to understand the topic a little bit more. Thank you.